Good morning, everyone, and thanks for your interest in this talk. I'll be taking questions throughout the talk, so just feel, to, feel free to write them in the box. So today I'll be talking about the role of citizen science and marine debris, and specifically how we can look at projects coherently using the same classification systems so that we can compare them across different scales. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Bedigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on at the moment, and recognize the elders past, present, and emerging. So first off, what is marine debris? There's a formal definition there, but in essence, it's anthropogenic, it's made of numerous materials, and it's within the marine and coastal environment. It's especially concerning for plastics, because as we increase plastic consumption, we increase production and therefore the chance of it leaking into the environment. And so there's an estimated 8 million tons entering the oceans annually. And we should all be aware that it's a threat to the environment. So for example, it causes ingestion, entanglement of different animals and other threats like facilitating bioinvasion, bringing species to new areas which might cause environmental harm. But we don't really know how they affect different animals um, and the impacts locally. And also, we should remember that they're a hazard to society and the economy as well. So, for example, uh, during one tourist period, heavy rains brought marine debris onto beaches, reducing visitor numbers because they didn't want to visit, costing the local economy millions of dollars. In terms of navigation, it can or tangle the rudder which costs millions of dollars in terms of rescuing uh, those boats. So for example, fishing vessels in Shetland, UK, costing 2 million euros in 2008. So how do we address marine debris? We need to understand the problem at multiple scales. So for example, we could look at a target approach and see the specific sources locally. A surveillance approach where we look across an entire region or a landscape approach where we understand the full big picture. And it's important because we can form specific management actions depending on the scale. So for example, for a targeted approach, you can inform local solutions. Where should we put the gross pollutant trap? Where should we put the bins? State initiatives benefit from a surveillance approach. So what, where do the management actions happen across New South Wales, for example? and the landscape approach informs national policy. So today I'll be talking to you about Tangaroa Blue Foundation and its many partners through three case studies, a targeted approach in Melbourne called Let's Strain the Drains, a surveillance approach in Queensland called Reef Clean, and a landscape approach in having a unified citizen science database using the same categories when you're collecting data. And it could be better seen as the Australian Marine Debris Initiative, which is that database containing different data from different projects, as well as community cleanups across Australia. So I'll start by describing the database in its entirety and then move to the surveillance and targeted approach um, after that. So the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. Since it's been going since 2004, led by Tangaroa Blue Foundation, in this year it has roughly 4,000 sites, um, the 16 million item entries in the database from over 24,000 cleanups. And this is a result of partnerships with over 1,400 organizations and entities entering their data into the database. So, what does one data entry look like? It's a cleanup where they sort the debris they find across a beach or a cleanup area for debris items greater than five millimeters. And they sort the debris of the 10 materials and 140 item types. It's submitted by a cleanup supervisor into the database and there's some quality control steps in between. So the data I'm about to present, um, just note that I have cleaned and filtered the data through quite a rigorous process, which I won't be talking about today, but it's in review in a scientific journal at the moment. So what we're going to focus on is the abundance and distribution of debris, how that shows us sources, 
and how that informs national management and policy. So first off, spatial distribution. We can see that most of the debris is on the east coast of Australia, next to population centres, as you can see here. So hotspots near Sydney, Brisbane, and to a lesser extent, the Whitsundays. So we can hypothesise that beaches that they're cleaning next to population centres have high litter loads. So this, in other words, the debris is coming from littering. But let's look at this box here, Cape York, far north Queensland. There's a hotspot there as well, and it's quite a remote area, so fairly low population. So we can hypothesize that the debris is coming from foreign countries floating over or from dumping at sea and arriving at Cape York. So further breaking down the sources, we can see that litter is the predominant source nationally across different regions. At roughly 45% of all debris across Australia, but fishing debris also varies. So, so for example, uh, in the northwest it's roughly 14%, but in the temperate east, which includes New South Wales, it's only 2% of the debris. So what does this mean for management? Well, it informs national policy. So this citizen science database can identify the needs and interventions. So as we just looked at in Cape York, perhaps we need to target shipping and foreign debris. But in other areas, we can see that we need to focus on littering. It allows us to prioritize actions against sources at scale. So we saw that littering was the main component. So we need to focus on that in specific areas. And we can coordinate across regions through this national snapshot of debris. The next project I want to show you focuses on more formal scientific sampling. So as we know, scientific sampling is rigorous. It has a measure of variability, although its main drawback or main limitation is that it doesn't have the same spatial and temporal resolution or scale as citizen science data. And citizen science data is higher resolution, has larger amounts of data. But as we are aware, there are sampling biases and data quality issues that we need to address. But what if we took the best of both worlds? So that is what we've done through Reef Clean, which is a partnership with the Australian government's Reef Trust and Tangaroa Blue Foundation, in addition to several other partners. And it is doing formal sampling across six natural resource management areas, uh, three beaches and estuaries per natural resource management area, and has structured sampling. So you can see, it's quite hard to see here, but there's yellow dots, so 16 sites. And what we've done is quadrats and transects. And the quadrats are placed at the high tide mark, so you get an understanding of below the high tide mark, above to the vegetation, and on the high tide mark. So we get a measure of variability both across a beach and along a beach. I should also mention that it is sampled quarterly, so we also get a measure of seasons. So if we're sampling across time, it allows us to monitor changes. So for example, the recent statewide monitoring of plastic bans. Are we seeing less of those on beaches? Through scientific sampling, we've increased accuracy and reliability. And it's also an added benefit of training citizen scientists in these scientific techniques, and they could apply them across different citizen science projects. The other thing is because the categories are shared in terms of how we've categorized the debris items, we can confirm or refine the hotspots from the national snapshot. We could also compare between formal surveys and normal cleanups. What's the difference in error? Or how, do, how much do they vary? And finally, we can inform regional monitoring, such as the report cards that they have across different areas over time. So we can scale from reef clean to national and deep using the same categories of debris when we're collecting.
Again, we're using the same categories, but now at a local scale, targeting one specific source. So this is Let's Strain the Drains across Port Phillip Bay or Greater Melbourne. And that was six LGAs, as you can see here. So three in the west, two in the east, and one slightly north of the Melbourne CBD. And on the left there is an image of a gross pollutant trap that's fitted onto a stormwater drain and collects all the larger pieces of litter and stops them from flowing through the stormwater network. And 120 gross pollutant traps were deployed and were surveyed every six weeks for litter. The next few slides are interesting because we were able to capture the lockdowns of COVID-19, but the main objective of this project was to look at four different land use zones per suburb or per LGA area. So we'll go through that in the subsequent slides. But first off, COVID-19, just because it's such a unique opportunity, we saw decreases in most categories of debris but an increase in OHS or occupational health and safety, such as mask and glove items, we saw a huge spike midway through the first Melbourne lockdown. And this is the work of Brie Chirot, which is currently in preparation um, and should be submitted very, very soon. But imagining if COVID didn't happen, this is the utility of surveying gross pollutant traps in red. So we can see across four different land use areas what the changes are in terms of debris loads. And this lets the council know where they should be targeting. So this is macro debris or greater than five millimeters. But what about micro debris? Well, that's mostly found in industrial areas, which makes sense since maybe that's where the plastic production is occurring. But also notice that pre and during COVID, there was no significant change, meaning that the economic activity was still happening, which was still resulting in a loss of micro debris. So it was not affected by COVID at all. So from targeted monitoring, we can form actionable findings at the local government area level. And, uh, if we look at different suburbs or LGAs, we get a citywide understanding. And again, it can be linked to existing AMDI data or Australian Marine Debris Initiative database. So what we find in the gross pollutant traps can be co directly compared to what we're finding on the adjacent beaches, for example. So that just shows the coherence between scales and why it's important. We need to be using the same categories to allow comparison of results. And it also ensures that the data can be used into the future. So in conclusion, debris monitoring and citizen science generally can be performed at different scales and answers different questions. So we need different levels or projects um, at different scales. But through the use of similar categories and definitions, we can compare between them and answer more questions and understand different areas over time. So in essence, if you combine different projects, you get a greater understanding of the plastic problem and marine debris in general. So thank you for listening and a big thanks first and foremost to all the data contributors and citizen scientists who made this possible. Big thank you to Heidi and Wally, Heidi being the CEO and founder of Tangaroa Blue and Wally Smith being the database manager of AMD. Finally, thanks to Bree who worked on the Let's Strain the Drains and Graham Clark and Emma Johnson for supervising my PhD. Thanks again.